The big market event this week that's not getting a lot of press is the collapse of the Terra stable coin, which has shown itself to be neither stable nor an actual coin. Tether, another much larger stable coin with a market cap of around $80 billion, has also come under pressure when it fell to around 95 cents yesterday before recovering somewhat. So what is causing these stresses and do they matter outside of the world of cryptocurrencies? Okay, so first up, stable coins are cryptocurrencies that are supposed to have a stable price in fiat currency. They're supposed to be pegged to a currency like the dollar, the pound, or the euro. And while they're a small segment of the overall crypto asset market, they are the most traded coins in the entire crypto space. They actually matter quite a lot. Now, a lot of you might be wondering why these things exist at all. Why would anyone want to own a crypto version of the dollar or the yen or the euro when actual dollars, yen and euros exist? Well, the reason that stablecoins exist is to reduce the fees, transfer times and the privacy issues associated with transacting in traditional foreign exchange. If you use stablecoins, you avoid the need for multiple bank accounts, often in different countries, to transfer funds internationally. You just need one crypto wallet in which you can hold these coins that are supposed to be pegged to your currency of choice. Stablecoins are there to make peer-to-peer -peer digital transfers possible without a third-party intermediary like a bank. Cryptocurrencies are usually even priced in terms of stablecoins as opposed to traditional currencies because of the quick settlement times required in the digital asset market. Now, a lot of what slows transactions down and makes them expensive in traditional financial systems are regulations like know your customer rules, anti-money laundering checks, and international tax avoidance regulations like FATCA. FATCA, for example, makes it extremely difficult for Americans to open bank accounts abroad at all. It's so expensive for foreign financial institutions to deal with American tax reporting requirements that they would rather usually just not deal with American customers at all, unless they're very large accounts that transact enough so that the fees outweigh the paperwork costs associated with regulatory compliance. Equally, the things that intrude on your privacy are required of banks as they need to ensure that you're not laundering money, evading taxes or evading sanctions. The reason that people like stablecoins then is that once they've transferred funds from the traditional financial system into a crypto wallet, they can hold those funds as a token that represents the dollar, the euro, the pound, or even Bitcoin, the national currency of El Salvador. And that token should hold its value in that currency while possibly paying you a suspiciously high interest rate. Now let's be clear, possibly the first sign that something might be a Ponzi scheme is that you're being pitched a low risk investment with an unusually high rate of return. Skipping on from that for the moment, stablecoins are of great importance within the world of decentralized finance or DeFi, where coded applications perform financial services on a permissionless blockchain. The stablecoins provide an anchor of stability and a means of payments built on distributed ledger technology, and they also move funds instantly. Thus, as DeFi grows, so does the use of stablecoins. And that's what we've seen. The value of crypto assets placed in DeFi applications for use as collateral or liquidity grew from around $30 billion to $234 billion in 2021 alone, according to Deutsche Bank. Now, there are over 100 different stablecoins out there, but they can be roughly divided into three groups. One, off-chain collateralized, two, on-chain collateralized, and three, uncollateralized or purely algorithmic stablecoins. Off-chain collateralized stablecoins like Tether are pretty easy to understand. They use traditional reserve assets to stabilize their value. So if you wanted to create one of these, you could take a dollar from someone, put it in a bank account and give them a crypto token that represents that dollar. When they wish to redeem the token, you would burn the token and return their dollar to them. This type of coin has a central issuer, and to a certain extent, 
that's something that crypto people want to get away from. They don't like centralization. The next type are on-chain collateralized projects, and these are backed with other crypto assets. This occurs on-chain and uses smart contracts instead of relying on a central issuer. If you buy one of these, you might lock your cryptocurrency into a smart contract in exchange for stable coins. You can later put your stable coin back into the same smart contract and withdraw your collateral. These projects are often over collateralized, so you might put up $2 worth of Ethereum to get a dollar's worth of stablecoin, the excess collateral being used to maintain stability within the system. Now, last up, we have purely algorithmic stablecoins. These don't use traditional assets or cryptocurrency as collateral. Instead, their price stability comes from the use of algorithms and smart contracts that manage the supply of tokens in circulation with the goal of pegging them to the value of a fiat currency like the dollar. Now, before I get to telling you the problems with Terra, let me tell you about today's video sponsor, Private Internet Access. I've been using VPN software for quite a while as I travel a lot and data security is very important to me. Private Internet Access is an easy to use and affordable VPN app for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS and more. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network, and what it means is that all of your internet traffic goes through a secure tunnel and your data is encrypted, making it much safer if you want to log on to your brokerage account from a coffee shop or an airport lounge. Private internet access is not just a great way to protect your data, but you'll also find that if you log into services like Netflix and Amazon Prime from different countries, different films are available. Private internet access is fast and reliable. They don't collect or track your data. You can use one subscription for up to 10 devices at the same time. There's a 30 day money back guarantee. So click the link in the description below to try it out risk free for less than $3 a month. And you'll also get three extra months for free. OK, so Terra, which has been all over the news this week, is an algorithmic stable coin. So how does it work? Well, Terra's code involves a proof of stake governance token, which is called Luna. Crypto people have a thing for the moon, along with a bunch of different Terra coins that are supposed to maintain a one to one peg with real world currencies. There's Terra USD, Terra GBP, Terra JPY and so on. Rising demand for any of these coins increases its supply, but each Terra coin is always worth its peg value in Luna. Traders can swap the governance token Luna for a pegged Terra coin and vice versa. For the sake of simplicity, we'll just discuss UST, which is supposed to always be worth one US dollar. The idea is that the price of UST is maintained by an arbitrage relationship with the governance token Luna. So one UST is supposed to be always worth one US dollar. And you can always exchange one UST for whatever quantity of Luna is worth one dollar at that point in time. So if UST trades at a discount to a dollar, you can buy it at that discounted price, let's say 99 cents, and then exchange it for one dollar's worth of Luna, making an instant profit. If it trades above a dollar, you can buy one dollar's worth of Luna for one dollar, convert that into a UST and then sell that for more than a dollar, once again making an instant and supposedly risk free profit. The idea is that because of this arbitrage relationship, while the price of Luna can fluctuate, the price of Terra should always be one dollar. If it trades above or below one dollar, people will exchange Terra for Luna or Luna for Terra until the price of Terra gets back to one dollar. If you want more detail on how this is supposed to work, I've put a link to the Terra Luna white paper in the video description. The core idea, though, is that because one Terra coin is always worth its peg value in Luna, there are opportunities to profit whenever it trades above or below its peg. Thus, it should in theory never move from its peg for long. At least that's how it's pitched. 
Now, hopefully you can already see how this can go wrong. The whole system relies on the idea that no matter what happens, Luna always has some value. And as its value falls, you can issue more and more of them until you've issued enough to keep Terra's value at a dollar. But of course, there's no reason to believe that you can issue an infinite number of coins at a positive price point, a coin that is backed by nothing but the faith of investors. In a situation where Luna is falling consistently, the code assumes that there's no point at which they're trying to issue more Luna at lower and lower prices, and there are no buyers. If this type of idea worked, companies like Lehman Brothers would have never gone bust, as they could have always just issued billions of dollars of new shares, if even at a fraction of a cent, and used that capital to pay off debt holders. In the real world, capital is not just always available like this. This makes no sense. Now, the structure of the Terra Luna pair is remarkably similar to what's technically known as fixed value convertible bonds, but which are referred to in the industry as debt spiral bonds. This type of bond is sometimes issued by companies that desperately need cash and have no other way of raising money. It always ends the same way, though, in a debt spiral. With a regular convertible bond, a $1,000 bond would convert into a fixed number of shares. But in a debt spiral bond, um, sorry, I meant in a fixed value convertible bond, the $1,000 bond instead converts into, let's say, $1,500 worth of stock, no matter what the stock price is. This feature is where the problem lies. The bond investor might sell some stock short in order to hedge the bond, but this would push down the stock price, meaning that the bondholder is now guaranteed more stock upon conversion, so they then sell even more stock short. This cycle continues on until the stock price hits zero. Okay, so you might wonder why anyone would store their money in an unbacked algorithmic stablecoin, especially because it's fairly obvious that there's nothing really there other than two coins that some guy made up, one of which he says is worth a dollar, and he bases this on the idea that he can issue an infinite number of the other coin to keep the first one at a dollar. On top of that, there have been other algorithmic stablecoins just like this one that have blown up in the past. You'd imagine that this is a fairly small market, but it's not. There are around $18.5 billion of UST in circulation. So that's a big number. But there are a few reasons that people might put their money in Terra, a synthetic dollar. One is that there's a lot of demand for stablecoins in general. And the other is that through the Anchor protocol, Terraform Labs, the entity that created Luna and Terra, pays an unsustainably high and frankly unexplainable 19.5% interest rate on UST deposits. Okay, so around this time last year, Terra actually lost its peg to the US dollar, but on a much smaller scale than has happened this week. And afterwards, when it had recovered to par, its founder, who calls himself the king of the lunatics, fair enough, decided to diversify. And so while Luna was high, he sold a lot of Luna and set up a foundation called the Luna Foundation Guard to buy up Bitcoin and several other cryptocurrencies so that there would be reserves available for use as an additional backstop against a severe drop in Terra. This at least diversified them away from the two coins that they had made up themselves. They now had reserves containing other coins that other people had made up. This is not necessarily as good a solution as it might at first sound, though, as it's very reasonable to believe that all crypto assets might be correlated to each other, and in a situation where there's a general crypto sell-off, it would become very difficult to support the dollar peg. Now, some people argue that the King of the Lunatics did this partially because it made the Luna Foundation Guard one of the largest Bitcoin holders, and Bitcoiners would hopefully then stop criticizing Terra as they wouldn't want to see Terra break its peg and cause a Bitcoin whale to start dumping Bitcoin to defend Terra. Anyhow, over the weekend, UST started to fall, ticking to 99 cents. On Monday, it briefly fell to, 
let's say below 70 cents, recovering on Tuesday to around 93 cents. Yesterday it fell as low as 30 cents and seems to be bouncing back a little bit. At the time of the recording, it's at 55 cents and things are not looking good. Here's a seven day chart. It's not exactly stable. If this was your level of stability, you would be in a straitjacket right now. The problems in Terra began spreading throughout the crypto space, and the sell off in Bitcoin can at least partially be blamed on this. As I mentioned earlier, we saw a much larger stablecoin, Tether, break its peg yesterday. Tether is an $80 billion stablecoin that's allegedly backed with reserves. However, the reserve figures have not been audited under generally accepted accounting principles. Tether was co-founded by the kid from the Mighty Ducks who tried to calm the market yesterday while wearing a funny hat. If you're not involved in crypto, you might think that this is a niche topic and of little importance, but financial regulators do appear to be concerned. On Tuesday this week, US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen brought up what she described as a run on UST in her testimony to the Senate Banking Committee in their hearing on risks to the stability of the US financial system. The losses in Terra are not really the same as a run like a bank run or a run on a backed stablecoin. In those cases, you have people demanding their deposits back immediately as they fear that the assets are not backed. In such a situation, assuming that the coin is actually backed, the assets that back the coin might have to be sold off quickly and due to poor liquidity, investors might sustain losses but they should still get most of their money back. With an unbacked stablecoin whose value is mostly held up by the faith of the investors and an arbitrage strategy which doesn't reasonably work, in a stressed market situation, losses can be expected to be much more extreme. The fact that panic in an algorithmic stablecoin like Terra is spreading to backed stablecoins like Tether could be of concern to financial regulators as it starts to impact the non-crypto world if they have to start dumping the money market instruments that they claim to own. Some of the panic in crypto is already affecting the real world as we see the prices of monkey art, a historically safe asset class, collapsing. Yesterday, Do Kwon, the king of the lunatics, tweeted a thread announcing his plan to fix things. One of the problems that he highlighted is that the smart contracts that do the exchange between Luna and Terra can't print new Lunas fast enough, causing the arbitrage mechanism to fail. His proposal is to print Luna faster, to clear out the backlog, and issue a lot more Luna so that one Terra can reliably be exchanged for one dollar's worth of Luna, which should only speed up the debt spiral. Another solution put forth is for the Luna Foundation Guard to step in selling Bitcoin and their other crypto assets to support the price of Terra, stabilizing the price. This is possibly a better approach, but at its core, Terra is deeply flawed, and there's no reason to believe that once all of the Bitcoin has been sold, that the debt spiral does not just start again. There are articles out there stating that the Luna Foundation Guard are attempting to raise an additional billion dollars to shore up UST by selling Luna to investors at a 50% discount. These investors will then be tied up for two years before they can sell this discounted coin. Now let's be serious here. This is a coin that was trading at around $95 two weeks ago. It was at 50 cents yesterday, and it's at 20 cents at the time of this recording. If you bought it at a 50% discount from pretty much any price, I'm not sure that you'd be comfortable with holding it for two minutes, not to mind two years, but best of luck with that. Now, a panic wouldn't be a panic without blaming short sellers, hedge fund managers, or other billionaire boomers. And so all over Twitter, there are people blaming Kenny G, the soft jazz saxophonist once again, for orchestrating an attack on Terra. I'm guessing that the goal is to turn a stable coin into a meme stock one way or another. You might maybe hope that a big investor could get involved 
inject capital and provide some external validation for the project, a bit like when Warren Buffett invested in Goldman Sachs during the credit crunch. Unfortunately, Elon Musk, the most likely saviour, has a lot of his capital tied up with the Twitter deal right now, so this probably won't happen. In fact, it's possible that Elon's whole plan to make Twitter profitable involves charging people to remove NFTs from their profile pictures so that in years to come, they can claim to have known it was nonsense at the time. The truth here is that it doesn't actually matter what caused the price of Terra to unpeg. The design of the product was fatally flawed from the very start, and thus it was just a question of when this would happen rather than if it would happen. Look, I'm no fan of Kenny G. In fact, I can't stand soft jazz. It just makes me angry. But if you have investments and when they go wrong, you're blaming short sellers, hedge funds, or some other invisible evil force, you're just not thinking straight. Kenny G didn't talk you into investing in your failed investments. Possibly other people did, and they are maybe more to blame. But no single investor or market maker or fund manager decides the price of any asset. There are no big conspiracies, no good and evil to be found in market prices. The idea that everyone on a Reddit board can decide to hold an asset forever and become infinitely rich makes no sense. When you look at a project like Terra, there are so many bizarre things that make no sense in it. Amusingly, you can earn a higher rate of interest lending it out than you pay to borrow it. This obviously can't work. A fairly simple takeaway, though, is that if something is supposed to be stable and low risk, it should not be paying 20% interest. A return of 20% a year is between two and three times the expected return of a stock market investment, where there's an actual company making and selling products or services. Simple logic tells you that something with two to three times the return of the stock market should have two to three times the risk of a stock market investment. Something with two to three times the risk of the stock market possibly also shouldn't have the word stable in its name. Let's remember that Bernie Madoff, the king of the Ponzi schemes, he didn't actually call himself that, it would have been too much of a giveaway, only promised 12% annual returns, and he had more volatility in his returns than Terra did, at least up until last week anyhow. If you found this video interesting, you should watch this one next on the likely regulations coming for stablecoins. Don't forget to check out today's video sponsor, Private Internet Access, using the link in the description below. Have a great day and talk to you again soon. Bye.